It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for organizing on this really interdisciplinary topic. As I think you'll see, uh, this talk is very different. <laughs> the preceding one and probably the, the next one will be as well. Um, so I'll be talking just more as an overview of United States drinking water challenges. And I think uh, up until recently, I think a lot of people didn't think we actually had that many drinking water challenges. So of course, I have to start off by talking about Flint, Michigan, just a little bit. This is not my research, but just to have a broader appeal to a wider audience. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about my research specifically of uh, a different sort, so different types of water quality challenges. Uh, one would be in heavy metal in Flint, Michigan, and then viruses or disease-causing agents in central northern Wisconsin. Okay, uh, most people are pretty familiar with uh, Flint, Michigan, I think. Uh, and certainly when I talk and teach this to my students, I really get a pretty strong reaction. Uh, people are paying attention. This is, this is uh, something that they know is sort of unjust or not acceptable. So just to recap and go through some of these points, since I think there probably some, a little bit of confusion on this. Normally this is, uh, given that I'm on a microphone, normally this is when I would ask for audience participation, but I'm going to minimize it at this point. <laughs> so where does this crisis extend back historically? If we, we know historically this can extend back quite a, quite a uh, far time back in time. Um, I'm actually not going to go as far back as one could, uh, but certainly I'm going to go one step further than a switching of the water source from uh, accessing a water through the city of Detroit to the Flint River, which is sort of where the common media starts their historical narrative. And I think you have to at least start this off to uh, the financial crisis and the, uh, the passing of laws by the state of Michigan that cities cannot take on debt to refinance or uh, essentially improve their water infrastructure or to build new water infrastructure projects, and the appointment of a local emergency manager uh, by the state uh, for these cities. So essentially, in geography, we call this scalar politics, but not to go too far. But essentially, there's different levels of government that are in conflict with each other. And in this case, the state is overriding the city's will. So the, the city manager is not elected locally, it is appointed by the state officials, and the city manager uh, is not accountable, in, in, perhaps in the same way. And then the city manager, therefore, uh, has made some of these changes to the drinking water source that essentially led to uh, the uh, essentially wide-scale contamination and uh, exposure to toxic chemicals in Flint, Michigan. Uh, so just to put this in perspective, right, this is 18 months, and there's about 100,000 people in Flint, Michigan, of which about 9,000 of them are children, who are exposed to very, very high levels of lead. Um, this is just a uh, photograph of the uh, city emergency managers sorry, the, the state-appointed emergency managers, uh, essentially toasting using uh, Flint River water that they are, uh, in theory, saving money, or what they thought they thought were saving money at the time being. Um, so I think what's a little bit confusing, perhaps, for people uh, in general is that how did they actually get exposed to lead? So it wasn't necessarily just changing the water source to the Flint River. So the Flint River itself, although of lower water quality, we call that sort of uh, lower raw water quality. Um, it's actually that they didn't treat the water in the Flint River, which had different chemical properties in an appropriate way. So it's actually purely on the management side, water management side. And on your left is an example of a corroded pipe. And essentially by not controlling the pH of the Flint River, which is different than the Detroit water source they were accessing, it essentially corroded their, their water pipes. Uh, lead pipes at the time being cheaper to install versus copper pipes or some more new materials. And they have essentially leached lead into your drinking water sources, which are then directly transported into your households and consumed by your children. Right. Um, so this, uh, there's many ways that this started to get attention. One of them, which was concerned citizens, started to uh, protest both at the city level and contact both the federal level, talking about scalar politics again. So now they're starting to bring the federal level. Federal EPA uh, doesn't have a lot of um, statutory or regulatory jurisdiction to be able to step in at this point in time, but they did refer them to a scientist at Virginia Tech who is an expert in uh, lead water testing. And then this person, Lan Walters, I'll show you her child in, in the next slide. Um, uh, they knew something was wrong pretty much right away, as well as a lot of residents. Not, not only does the water look visibly different, uh, uh, there are visible rashes, you start to lose hair, uh, your eyebrows eye and eyelashes start to fall out, 
Uh, it's, it was pretty clear that something was going on. And this is actually an actual picture of one of the water samples, right? It's clearly a lower water quality. Uh, somewhat startlingly, startlingly, surprisingly, the average lead in the water samples, there was about 30 of them, was about 2,000 parts per billion. I know that sounds really abstract, uh, 2,000 parts per billion. That would be like two drops in a uh, large fish tank. If you have two, a dropper, two drops of lead. And you might think, well, maybe why is that? How is that harmful? If you didn't have sort of the appropriate context. But sort of the federal standard is about 15 um, parts per billion in drinking water. So uh, many, many times greater than the federal standard. And really, there is no safe level of exposure to lead. Uh, lead, we've known for quite, has been studied for quite a while, right, the uh, uh, Mad Hatter. Uh, was exposed to lead poisoning. We know there's a variety of, uh, of negative downsides, but these, in short, these are long-term irreversible uh, changes. For example, we know that there's at least a rough linkage if you double the amount of lead in the body, human body, that your IQ decreases about a point or two. And that's for your lifetime, right? You can still, IQ is somewhat modifiable, right? You can still learn, but this is a serious long-term challenge. Uh, there's also learning developments, uh, disabilities, abdominal pain, fatigue, headaches, and some other loss of developmental skills. Um, some other things that you might not have, uh, have known as well is that uh, Flint also had an uh, impact on fetal deaths, which I know sounds somewhat strange, uh, but essentially then uh, women and couples who were expecting uh, many of their fetuses didn't make it to term. So they can essentially look at the neighboring cities, calculate different rates of how many uh, babies would have been born over this period of time, and we see a precipitous drop in Flint, Michigan. So something along the order of somewhere about 200 more children would have been born. So some things that we don't even see uh, in terms of the surface are impacting our, our society. Um, this is just a map of showing us how do we figure out then where should we target our resources? What can we do about it now? So in essence, then, uh, some of the, I'll, I won't make this too prolonged, essentially, one of the plans is to replace about 18,000 uh, lead pipes in the city, 18,000. They've made some progress. They're about halfway towards that goal, if you will. Uh, but they have to figure out where do we target, where do we test. And they did that by essentially uh, taking some samples from specific locations and then essentially figuring out the age of the pipes going to each of these neighborhoods and households and using some uh, science to figure out where else should we target. Uh, this is just the current status map if you're interested of where they're at, again, about halfway through. So that I wouldn't say this is sort of a long-term prolonged uh, problem. Just as a side note, uh, when we see this also has broader environmental implications, it's not just uh, people in Flint are being exposed, right? We've uh, had concerned people in Tallahassee test uh, water in our um, children's schools. Uh, this is certainly has been a, a wake-up call across the nation. Uh, unfortunately, it should have been much quicker. But this is regarding who consumes bottled water, or essentially who doesn't consume tap water in this figure. And this is, uh, there's a few things going on here, but I'll walk you through it. On the left-hand side, it's just a race, race and ethnicity. But essentially, are you drinking less water uh, compared to your comparison group here? So uh, those communities that are uh, African American or Black, Hispanic tend to drink less water, tap water, and are probably drinking more bottled water. And I, so uh, in some ways, this is sort of negative from an environmental perspective that we have more waste, that we have waste issues we have to deal with, but we also now start to understand how these historical contexts and lack, sort of lack of distrust in some of our civil institutions is, is percolating outwards. And then uh, just to finish off the slide, uh, there is uh, people with more education, and of course people who are treating their water, which is sort of a segue to my next topic. Well, are more likely to drink tap water. Okay, so Flint, Michigan, uh, I think most people would start to agree that we saw some challenges here in high income nations. I'll, I'm going to talk about one other one in central and northern Wisconsin, and I'm going to divide that into sort of two parts. One is just looking concurrently to today, I um, mean, sort of what's going on now, and one to the future. Okay, so estimates vary widely, but anywhere from about um, one half to 6% of all the people in the US get sick from their drinking water each year, which 
you know, on the high end seems kind of high. Right? And that seems sort of strange. You're, most of you are drinking treated drinking water. It's been chlorinated. It's been filtered. It's been through some uh, engineering processes <coughs> uh, that were discovered a long time ago. Um, uh, but nonetheless, for a variety of reasons, uh, one is that there's a couple of disease-causing agents in our drinking water sources that aren't perfectly treated. Uh, so particularly if you are uh, have some pre-existing health conditions, you're a cancer survivor, maybe you're HIV AIDS positive, um, maybe you have diabetes, um, you might be uh, more likely to be uh, to contract a severe illness from your drinking water. And that's one large cap of the population. Uh, another segment of the population is going to be accessing private wells. So even in Florida, we know that there's a, a, lot, a fairly large population, a group of people who are drinking private wells, which are essentially unregulated in the United States at the federal level. At the state level, in general, maybe you have to test that well once if you're selling it, but you don't have to monitor how the water quality is. So we know that there's a certain amount of people who are likely getting sick from drinking water from the private wells as well, meaning that they're not necessarily treating them or maybe they're not treating them that well. And I'm going to be talking about the third group is that uh, in some areas um, of the United States where you're accessing groundwater, right, we access uh, groundwater here, but we treat it. But in some states, you don't have to treat your groundwater if you're serving that to a municipality, which sounds sort of strange. Um, and sort of intuitively, uh, my research wanted to look at these communities and see then, are they having more health, stomach-related and health-related problems from this? So just to break this down, um, about 13 million people, are, uh, or 7% of the population, might be getting exposed through surface water, just to illustrate that, versus groundwater, right? Different water sources. And these are regulated by different uh, rules in the United States, surface water being more stringently regulated. You have to disinfect, chlorinate, or treat uh, using some more advanced process in the United States. But groundwater, it's advised that you treat, but is not required. And then talk more specifically about groundwater. Uh, in some of these communities, uh, sort of these off the grid or essentially smaller municipalities, you essentially will have a lot of households that might be on septic tanks, they might be near agricultural regions, and then they have other sources of uh, disease-causing agents that can either be uh, flow over the land into a well that's maybe not properly protected or covered, or it can percolate uh, through the uh, water table uh, into a, a drinking water source. And this latter one has actually been more of a surprise recently. I think a lot of people historically thought that the soil, just through its properties, would naturally sort of filter or clean all the disease-causing agents out of it. And that we found that's not actually true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where am I looking? I know most of you are probably not as familiar from the Midwest, unless you're on Facebook. <laughs> but this is central and northern Wisconsin. It's largely an agricultural region. It's, um, this includes uh, Marshfield, Wisconsin, which is probably the largest city in Wisconsin that you've never heard of, um, because it's not connected to a freeway. Um, it's, there is a fair amount of um, uh, concentrated agricultural feeding operations. And in here, and it's perhaps a little harder to see from the black back, but these areas in black are municipalities that are accessing groundwater that are, is untreated. Uh, they're essentially sucking it out, uh, maybe treating the pH a little bit and sending it to your household. Versus there's a variety of other municipalities that uh, tend to be larger and are treating their drinking water. So when, it, when we heard about this area, it sort of provided a natural experiment to say, well, we can compare these areas. They're in generally this similar sort of uh, environmental conditions. Are there different relationships then and who's getting sick based on their treatment type, whether it's a private well, a municipality that treats it, or those few small municipalities, number of municipalities that don't treat it. And we focused on children uh, for a few reasons, right? People care a lot about children, uh, but they're also the most sensitive to environmental exposures, and particularly these infectious stomach exposures. Uh, and particularly infants, their immune systems, uh, their other bodily systems are still developing throughout their first year first or second year, and they might experience more severe complications. So they might be an indicator of, or more sensitive to uh, if you're living in these communities where there are drinking water problems. So we looked at about uh, 5,000 children and just, just took a, sum, a sample of how many of them were getting sick across the study area. And I'll just show that study area again. Uh, I should also mention that this entire study area is served by one hospital network that we work with. So that also was fairly convenient in the sense that uh, we had essentially had a, a 
a, a good census of the whole population. Uh, so our, our question there is uh, relatively straightforward. We, we really want to know if there's some disparities based on your drinking water uh, treatment practices on who if people are getting sick in your community. Uh, but to do that, we actually used something a little bit more indirect to identify that. And, and we thought we could use some information about weather or climate to say, if, is that a, one indicator is if your drinking water system is well-functioning. So essentially, based on that schematic I showed you where uh, water may be transported through the water table or over the land surface, uh, we would hypothesize then, or our, our scientific first guess is that uh, in these areas where you are treating your drinking water, there's not going to be a relationship. It doesn't matter if it rains more or not, because uh, even though there's more disease-causing agents going into your drinking water sources, you're treating them. But in these areas where you're not treating them, it does matter more if, uh, if it is a rainy week versus a dry period, because there's not going to be that transport of disease-causing agents. Okay, so we looked at, we, we aggregated these weekly clinic and hospital visits for a variety of, uh, of clinical diagnoses related to stomach illness essentially diarrhea or, and a broad variety of other um, diagnoses. And we use patients, the patient's address where they likely were exposed or likely ingested drinking water. And these are children under um, five again. So these are, uh, there's some of them might be uh, going to some daycares, but it's probably closer to where their home address is. And they're probably accessing the same drinking water source. Uh, so we're going to essentially relate these environmental conditions to the number of people getting sick over time. In, um, particularly rainfall and stream discharge. We're not going to control for, the, for um, other temporal changes over time. I won't go into this too much. We're essentially using time series statistics. The benefit is that it is, is essentially comparing one population to itself over time. And if, if that's, since we know what that population is, as long as nothing uh, is largely changing about that population, uh, that controls for some things that we may not have in our studies design, like socioeconomic status or race. And we're going to look at these drinking water sources separately. And again, we're going to see, we're going to try to see that if, if there's more rain, are there more people getting sick? If it is, maybe that's a, an indicator that we need to do more uh, treatment in these communities. So uh, just, I'm just going to, before I get to that, I just want to talk a little bit about the cases themselves. Uh, this is the health insurance status of these cases by, uh, of all the childhood cases, uh, meaning uh, you have commercial or private health insurance right, that's largely provided by employer during our period of study prior to the Affordable Care Act, uh, Medicaid and missing. So Medicaid, right, uh, essentially you have to have some income requirements, either essentially for or households. Uh, so I don't have directly socioeconomic status, but uh, of all the cases, about half of them actually are covered by Medicaid as compared to, if we just look at what proportion of people in the area are covered by Medicaid, that's only about 7%. So there's this disproportionate burden here uh, going on. Uh, so the first thing, uh, and do we find some different relationships between rainfall and who's sick over time? And in our untreated uh, areas of accessing, is accessing untreated water, we see this pretty large and clear relationship, meaning that if you have more rainfall, uh, it goes up, the, your risk of getting sick does go up. Uh, to a point, and if it gets really wet during these extremely rainy weeks, you really have a very large risk of getting sick from drinking your uh, drinking water. Um, and sort of consistent, these seem like they don't show anything, but that is consistent with our sort of our study design in the areas where you are treating your drinking water, particularly these treated municipal um, areas. There's absolutely no relationship between rainfall and who's getting sick. Um, somewhat surprisingly, we actually thought we might see them in private wells as well, right, because they're not treating their drinking water also. But uh, we suspect that there might be uh, fewer sources of drinking water contamination in some of these areas that have private, private wells versus a municipality where you might have leaking sanitary sewers uh, and things like that. Uh, so pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> you, didn't, you don't need this study to show you that water treatment and improved infrastructure is going to improve your health. Uh, but we do show that rainfall could be one indicator to detect this, not just in this community, but we could probably do this across the nation. Uh, and I'll just talk very, uh, briefly in the next bit about how this might be related to climate change. Um, so in the future, then, uh, we did a sort of a follow-up study, which is really more of just a policy thought experiment of uh, what if we decided to um, uh, quantify the risk of climate change in this area, climate change is going to make this area wetter, essentially, in, in the 
period we're most interested in. Uh, for Florida, we're actually, there's sort of the mix signals. We're actually quite not quite sure at the moment. And then I don't want to just look at climate change. I also want to look at what can we do as a society? Are we actually going to start to install drinking water treatment in these areas? And at what rate? So I used one based on a sort of a slow historical rate and one based on a more, more rapid aggressive rate and see how does that actually impact this rainfall related gastrointestinal illness or sickness. So I already presented this part where we use these observed information and illness and related to that precipitation. And then I'm just going to add in some climate change projections. I won't go into those in too depth, as well as a couple of scenarios or, uh, on drinking water treatment and quantified how many people actually might be getting sick or the rate that they might be getting sick in the future. Uh, this is just sort of a, a nicer way to illustrate scenarios. Scenarios are, um, for planning purposes, uh, what might the world look like in 30 years. Uh, maybe we might be more regionally integrated. Uh, maybe our governance may work together more, or maybe it may be more fragmented. So and then instead of showing you a variety of numbers that go behind these, I just <laughs> showed you some cartoons illustrating this bit. Um, this is not sick of time, I'm actually going to move on. Again, uh, this area is projected to get wetter. And what do we see then? Uh, the take-home message. Uh, well, climate change is going to slightly increase our risk based to our, our baseline or comparison period uh, by something about like one or two percent. So it's not really that big, which I know is not maybe what you hear commonly in many of the news stories. Maybe you hear climate change is going to be gloom and doom. Uh, but more importantly, really, is that if we start to do these adaptation procedures, start uh, adding drinking water treatment in these communities, we actually would see a much greater drop off and much greater in the impact of climate change. So really the take home messages, and this is rates here, so this case is for 10,000. So we could see um, maybe only about a fifth of the cases uh, if we actually start treating all the drinking water in the region. Um, so in short, uh, high condition still face drinking water challenges. You can think of this as an environmental justice issue. Uh, some of them are easier to see, and some of them only um, rise to the surface when there's additional uh, sort of a additional attention point to it. And we actually have the knowledge and tools to address these. So maybe I'm like, somewhat differently than the previous speaker, we know how to treat our drinking water. <laughs> uh, we have uh, plenty of certification and knowledge to do that. Uh, we don't necessarily have the political will though to start to address those. So thank you very much. Yes, so the question is um, what types of pipes are they replacing? I, uh, yes, both the municipal and the street to home, which would have, um, you know, could technically be sort of the private householder owners, uh, per, um, historically under the purview, but yes, is something that a lot of these households can't afford to do on their own. Great question. I guess we'll go Mohammed. So you close by saying that there isn't a lot of political will. Um, what do you think is the cause of that? So in 2014, for example, only 27 states reported um, lead water levels to the CDC. And of that, 40% of the states um, had lead levels higher than Flint, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a nationwide disaster, but it's not you know heavily looked at. And there is legislation for it. So Title 10 of the US code is dedicated specifically to that. But as you said, there really isn't a political will. So what do you think is, you know, the cause of this um, discrepancy wherein states do not abide by federal regulations and politicians are actually paying less attention to that? It's an inference that I have. Yeah, that's a really difficult question just to, re uh, I guess I'll try to restate just for the uh, the live audience, but it's essentially what are some of the reasons for the political will? Uh, the the uh, audience member mentioned uh, there's some existing legislation on the books to help and address these issues, and as well as we know that there's some evidence from other states that uh, lead is is uh, is not necessarily like a cured problem. Um, yeah, that's a really tough challenge. I think there is sort of a, a probably a just sort of a moment in time based on our governance uh, where there is less distrust in our institutions. Uh, perhaps water is politicized in a way that it hadn't been before. 
I don't really have a great answer as to sort of why we don't have enough political will for it. If you do ask in general um, in the environmental field, if you ask what people are most concerned about, water is number one. Uh, it's above air. Water is huge. Uh, so, I mean, I think people are concerned. They're not, I don't think maybe that's that level of activism or the level of uh, being able to reach across and understand how water is connected to a variety of issues might not be there yet. Or perhaps our legislatures, uh, representatives aren't listening to this as much. I think that's possible as well. But that's probably uh, better to have uh, more of a discussion though. I guess we'll go back then, Chris, next. Um, two questions, kind of rolling to one. Um, so does actually like filtering your water help with this? And also you said treating the water with different chemicals. Are there signs that those type of chemicals would have an effect on the water? Yeah, um, great question. So um, in terms of the different types, I talked about two, uh, one a toxic and one is a disease causing agent. Uh, there are filters, effective filters for both. The one for lead is a little bit more is expensive. It's not like a Brita filter, um, but those are available. Um, hundreds of dollars per household. That's what we call sort of a point of use treatment device. And then um, uh, this, similarly, there is there are effective filters for um, disease causing agents. Those would also be more expensive, ultraviolet uh, treatment devices. And then from there, are there any sort of downsides to adding some uh, treatment processes to our, our, our water sources? And uh, there are some downsides. Uh, there are limited though, in terms of adding chlorine, uh, depending on that process, it can uh, create some residuals, toxic byproducts uh, that in over apply to a large number of people, uh, does have a few minor effects. Uh, so I guess it's really balancing out those. Are those bigger than uh, the risks of, of enough people getting sick? Or similarly, there's other treatment processes that don't have these uh, residual processes like ultraviolet tr treatment. Great question. And then Chris? <coughs> okay, so I'm assuming at this point that those folks up there in Wisconsin realize they have a problem with their untreated water. Are they demanding that they have their water treated? Or are they just saying, Oh well, like people get sick and we'll and you know we'll live with it. Or what's their what's their response? Yeah, great. So how, what do the local people think in uh, central northern Wisconsin? Uh, I think it depends on the communities. Some of them have been moving, uh, particularly the larger ones that have some resources, have been moving towards treating their drinking water. Uh, some of them there has been a sort of a, a pushback, and I think that's partly to being called out or as uh, or singled out. Um, I think uh, some of those, that being said, I guess there's sort of two things. On one level, uh, the Wisconsin state legislature, again, talking about different levels of politics, uh, passed a law saying you, that the state agencies can't force these communities to treat their drinking water. So on one level, there is a pushback, sort of systematic statewide against um, having interference or having someone else tell them what they should do. On another level, uh, if you're actually looking at which communities are starting to adopt drinking water treatment, there are a couple more over time. So I don't, I don't think, I think there's this interplay. I don't, uh, that where, yes, they might be able to come to some consensus over this, even if they don't have to admit something's wrong. And then uh, from there, typically those, some of the people will say that it's either too expensive or they don't like how the water tastes if they add chlorine. Um, but I think expense is probably pointed to most, even though there are a variety of programs that will help them uh, meet these uh, extra expenses. Just in your research, have you found any type of interference of corporate interests, either industrial farming or industrial mining or fossil fuel industries, and their impact on whether or not regulations are happening in, in nearby, in, you know, nearby towns, or, or any of that kind of influence? Yeah. Okay. Great question. So the question is about if there are sort of um, conflicts or interference between uh, private actors and uh, communities if they do discover or try to limit them discovering uh, drinking water problems. So I know this is not in the literature yet. I think in northeastern Wisconsin, there are some communities that are uh, recognized that they do have some drinking water problems. So Wisconsin, like parts of Florida, actually has a limestone underneath it, karst. It's very porous, meaning that uh, not only do some of these more serious disease causing, sorry, smaller disease causing agents, but a wider range of disease causing agents actually are going into the drinking water sources. Um, so there are, there are communities in northeastern Wisconsin that, that do want more attention, but are, are um, 
there is some tension with the, I guess, richer households. There's not necessarily factory, it's not, sorry, it's not necessarily family farms anymore. They're essentially, a family farm is huge. Uh, there is some conflict between these richer, um, larger family farms and uh, people who are having drinking water problems. Thank you. a 10 minute break. Feel free to get coffee or some of the breakfast items that are over there, but we're going to come back for our next session, session starting at 10.50.